Thanks, Dominique. That was actually very kind words. You know, I, after that uh, little introduction, I can hardly wait to hear what I'm about to say. So anyway, what I need to start off saying is that if you haven't picked up already, I am not from around here. I'm from Australia, which is almost the opposite side of the planet. Thank you, someone out there. So let me begin by saying I loved that last song, that bilingual version, but I need to teach you a bit of Aussie as well. All right, so we're going to have a try at this. Just repeat after me. G'day, mate. See, now I feel at home. Ah. You know, in Australia, in uh, the capital of Australia, and I live not far from the capital, it's, it's Sydney. Uh, has anyone been to Sydney, or Australia for that matter? We've got a couple of... Okay, you need to get down under, it's a great part of the world. But uh, in Australia, we have this, this uh, it's the, the largest foot race. Well, it's, we call it a fun run, but many people don't think that fun and run should be put together. So anyway, it's like a, a community foot event. And what happens is you start in Sydney and then you go all the way to one of Australia's most popular beaches and we have beautiful beaches uh, called Bondi Beach. Anyway, my, my good mate, um, Jace, he was driving to this event one morning and he said he was driving along, it was very early in the morning, he was quite tired and he's you know, driving along and then all of a sudden it just started to rain a little bit. And then as you know, sometimes when it starts to rain the roads can get a bit slippery but as he took the exit off the freeway, all of a sudden, as he went, his back wheels must have hit a bit of a slippery patch, and the back of the car started to drift to the side. And he said, all of a sudden, I wasn't so tired anymore. I was like, ah! And he said, I quickly steered back the other direction, and then the back of the car slid now this direction. And he said, so I turned it back, and then progressively, he was oversteering this car as it's sliding backwards and forwards, until, he said, I was sliding almost completely sideways when the back wheels hit the edge of the road, this curve, this bit of a lip. And as it hit it, he said the car went over. And he remembers just going onto the roof, windscreen shatters, and then over onto its feet, on its wheels, and then over again. He says, I do not know how many times this car rolled, but eventually it came to a stop right side up. He said the windscreen was completely smashed. The windscreen wipers were still <coughs> backward and forwards across the screen. And at that exact moment, as he sat in this hot sweat, <sighs> breathing erratically, on the radio came... <laughs> and what's the song? Don't worry. Be happy, that's right. He says, you know, I cannot hear that song today without <gasps> all of a sudden breaking out in this hot sweat, sitting in the car imagining this scene. You see, that song... It's incredibly catchy. You all, we all know it. Why? Well, I suggest, and the reason, it was actually the first a cappella song to reach the, the top of the, the, the charts. I, I believe that the reason it's so catchy is because it's something that we're all going after, isn't it? We all like the sentiment of that song to don't worry, to be happy. In fact, there was a, a remarkable young lady, if I can get the next slide, um, Anne Frank. You know, she wrote this. She said, we all live with the objective of being happy. We all want to thrive. Our lives are all different, and yet, in a way, they're exactly the same. We're all after this common pursuit. And so I want to talk to you this morning about happiness. And we know that being happy, obviously... or uh, Raise your hand if you don't want to be happy. Excellent. Because they're about to evict you, if you uh, from, the, from the room if you didn't want that. So we all want to be happy. right? So what does it take to be truly happy? Well, I want to introduce you to this guy here. This uh, gentleman is, has the name Professor Martin Seligman. Raise, raise your hand if you've heard of Martin Seligman. Okay, let me tell you his story. An incredibly successful psychologist. And in 1997, he was actually voted in as the president of the American Psychological Association, which is a pretty big deal. He'd been an amazing researcher and a clinician, and he'd done some incredible work over his career. And then the American Psychological Association says, we want you as our president, and when you're the president, you get to choose a theme for your presidency. What would you like that to be? And he thought, wow, that's a great question. What would I like to be to, to, for the association to really concentrate on? And he said, well, you know what? I'd done a lot of stuff. He'd written books on learned helplessness and bipolar and quite a few other sort of psychological conditions. And he said, I'm, I was thinking, I thought, well, let me go away and, 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 and think about this. And they said, you go for it. And then he had this epiphany. And it came in the form of his five-year-old daughter. Now, Martin Seligman says 
that uh, he is actually a nimbus cloud around the home. You know what a nimbus cloud is? Like a storm cloud? He says, I'm not a very happy person to hang around, all right? Which is remarkable when, as, as a, when you get to hear the rest of his story. But he said, I was, I'm a bit of a grouch, a bit of a grump. And he said, I'm out in the garden on this Sunday morning pulling out weeds. And he says, no, I hate pulling out weeds. He said, but here I am pulling out these weeds. This sucks. I hate this. He said, when all of a sudden my five-year-old daughter walks up behind me and she stands there and she says, Dad, 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 just keeps doing this. And he says, I'm like, yeah, what? What do you want? And she keeps on and on because she wants him to turn and eye contact her. So in the end, he's like, she, as she keeps going, Dad, Dad, he, he says, I, I'm, I'm throttling a couple of weeds that I've just pulled out. And I look and I say, yes, what? What do you want? I've already said, what do you want? Anyway, he says, my five-year-old daughter looks at me and she says, Dad, you know how when I was four, I used to whinge and whine and whinge and whine? And he's like, yeah, get on with the story, hurry up, I've got stuff to do here. And she says, well, you told me I had to stop being such a grouch, uh, sorry, a, a, a whiner and whinger, and so I did. Now it's your turn <laughs> to stop being such a grouch. And he said, I sat there like, Ugh! and then this light bulb moment came. And this is what the epiphany was. He said, I realized in that moment that as a psychologist who was at the absolute top of my game, I spent all of my time and all of my colleagues did the exact same thing, helping people who were somewhere, if we had like a feel-good ladder, you know, with this, this is like a zero, and that's like, you know, a positive scale, we were helping people who were somewhere down here on this negative end of the spectrum, tried to help them just to come up to be normal again. Now, I don't know what normal is. I've actually never met a normal person. Maybe there's one here. I'd love to meet you. If you are normal, come and introduce yourself. You know, what he said is we always, all the, of, of the psychology's time over the hundred or so years that it had been operating had been about trying to get people who were somewhere down there, some sort of disorder or dysfunction, trying to just bring them up to here. And he said, but when as psychologists do we ever help people, normal people, who are just doing okay, do better than okay, to actually thrive? And so he said, this will be the theme for my presidency. It will be positive psychology. What does it take to help individuals, couples, families, communities, workplaces, even countries to do better than okay, to actually thrive? Or the word he likes to use is to flourish. And what he's done since that time in 1997, the area has just exploded. There are so many studies, hundreds of studies have been conducted. There, is, there are journal articles on this, books have been written. And Martin Seligman is really considered the father of this, this, this positive psychology movement. And the insights, to me, are fascinating. Coming out of secular psychology, they just align so nicely with Christianity. Let me tell you what they've found. Martin Seligman has identified that there are five things that you need from a psychological point of view happening in your life for you to truly thrive, to truly flourish. And he has a little acronym, and the acronym is PERMA. Now, when I have read this, and I've done a lot of research in this space myself, these five things, P, E, R, M, A, stand for something. And I'm wondering if in your brain, start quizzing yourself. What do you think these five things are? Well, what I can tell you is I don't like the order that he presents these in. And I've actually met Martin Seligman. Here's a photo of us. Uh, I met him at a conference. We had a good chat. In fact, there's a bit of product placement. There's my, my latest book, Live More Happy. And I sort of, someone said, oh, we'll take a photo. I said, great. And I just put my book just there. Like, so anyway, that's what you've got to do. Um, anyway, I chatted with Martin Seligman. I said, hey, you know what? I don't like the order that you've put these in. I think there's an, a better order. And we talked about it, and he said, mm, oh, well, you know what, I think you've got a case. So with my blessing, I will let you change the order. So here is the order that I prefer to use. Can we show this slides? It is PERM. Okay, now there's a little graphic just so that to help you remember, you know, what this is. This is PERM. Now, I know I'm Australian, I'm not great at spelling, but I know that it's not actually spelt this way, but this is just for your mental benefit, okay, so you can help understand what they are. So, P-E-A-R-M. I believe, and the reason I arrange them in this order, is that these are pathways to a thriving life, to a flourishing life. 
right? But the P starts with the most superficial pathway, and the M, and the science is strong here, goes through to the more deeper levels of flourishing and thriving. So I ask you the question, what do you think they are? P, E, what do they stand for? A, R, and M. Think about it, think about it. I'm about to tell you. Okay, in fact, what I want you to do, we're going to, on the count of three, I want you to call out what you think P, let's start with P, what P might stand for. You ready? One, two, three. All good words, I'm sure. So here is what Martin Seligman has actually found. It is pleasure. People actually need a sense of pleasure. Now, raise your hand if you do not like pleasure. This is good, all right? So no, no one around goes, nah, just not into that. Nah, I'll pass on pleasure, please. I much prefer discomfort. All right, yeah, no one does this. We all like pleasure. Raise your hand if you don't like to laugh. You don't like to laugh. All right, we can talk later. Um, so, you know what? They're, most of us love to laugh. You know, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. And in fact, biblically, there's good supporting evidence that we should be doing this. You know, in, in, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, take the light in each light-filled hour. You know what? These are positive things. This is a good thing. God gave us this to enjoy. But there is a problem with pleasure. There is a problem with laughter. And I'll share a little story to illustrate what that problem is. You see, I grew up in a, in a tiny little country church in, in, uh, in Australia. And we had about 13 people in our church on a good day. It was a tiny little building. And uh, anyway, we, uh, we, there were four kids in our, um, in our church. Uh, there was myself, my brother, who is three years younger than I. And then there were two girls. And I, can't, I can remember one of the girls was named Adam. Sorry, Eve. <laughs> Not Adam. It was definitely Eve. <laughs> So one of the girls was called, because that's a really obscure name for a girl, Adam, even in Australia. So one of the girls was called Eve, and then she had a sister, and I can't remember what her name was. But anyway, our Sabbath school teacher, she said, she was pretty excited, took her job fairly seriously. She said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to put on a church play. Now, I didn't know much about church plays, or I didn't have much theatrical experience, but I'm looking around at the four of us, thinking... This sounds like a pretty tough gig. I don't know how you're going to pull this off with four kids. We're going to do a church play. Our Sabbath school teacher, she took this very, very seriously. She said, no, that's it. This is going to be the best thing ever. This was her moment to shine. She said, we're going to first start with auditions. I'm thinking, really? You're going to audition us four kids for a church play? Anyway, so we did these auditions. And when, after the auditions, when she saw the, the caliber of talent that I had as a performer... I was given a non-speaking, non-moving part, all right? So this says something about me, doesn't it, right? So I was given a non-speaking, non-moving part in this play. My brother, three years younger than me, gets given a speaking whilst moving part. And right? I'm still bitter about this today. I, anyway, then, you know, we got given our parts. Anyway, the big day came. She made us come to after school. We practiced our parts. I, was just, I just got really, really good at not moving and not talking, just standing there. And I remember the big day came. So there we were. The four of us were, oh, no, so the three of us at the front. Um, there was Eve. Um, she was dressed in her sheet. You know, those sheets that you wear that apparently were very fashionable in biblical times. She was where that, she was playing the part of Jesus. She had her sister who was dressed in a sheet too. It was one of the disciples. I, I don't know what I was actually, but I just stood there concentrating really hard and intently on not moving and not speaking. I was dressed in my sheet and I was sort of just a extra, I suppose. Anyway, I'm standing there. And then my brother, right? Then my brother, he's given this part where from the back of the, the, the church, at the critical moment, our Sabbath school teacher was sitting right here, you know, conducting this whole thing. At the critical time, she was to look back, give him the nod, and he was to run in. Now, I need to move. Sorry, can't remember. I need to illustrate this. So he's at the back there, dressed in his sheets as well. And at the critical moment, when she gives the nod, he has to run down the aisle and call out and say, the Romans, the Romans are coming. All right, so here we are. We're all set. The scene is set. This little play is advancing well. And all of a sudden, from up the back here, my brother's eager, waiting to... To, you know, his moment to shine. The Sabbath school teacher looks around, gives him the nod, and then all of a sudden my brother comes tearing in. And I can tell you, folks, he was so, you know, full of the joy of living 
that he took this part, he was striding down. The speed was incredible. And as he was doing it, these sheets just billowed out behind it. It was like something out of Chariots of Fire. It was a beautiful thing. And I still have that vivid memory, you know, as he's running down. It was like slow motion, like... Dum, 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 dum. And then he started his line. The Romans! And just as he got to the second Romans, one of those wonderful sheets just caught around the edge of one of our ornate pews. And the tension, he was going so fast, the tension sort of took up around his sleeve and then around his neck. True story, I remember all of a sudden his head just stopped there, his feet kept going, and he went, the Romans, the like this. And he then just hit the ground. Well, first of all, he sort of, his feet went and then he hit the ground. And then I remember him standing up and sort of like staggering around. His head was red. He looked at dear Mrs. Wadsley, he's about 83, and thought, that woman just took me out. <laughs> he didn't know what's going on. And, but what I can tell you, you know, from my point of view, here I am, standing at the, the front of the church, you know, really focused on not moving and not speaking. Right. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I saw my brother in my own flesh and blood, injured like that, humiliated like that, I just lost it. And so all of a sudden I'm like, <laughs> like this. And I remember just going, oh man, this is so, and it's just so funny. Anyway, I'm looking and the, my Sabbath school teacher is like, stop, you're not meant to speak, right? No, 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 no sounds. And I'm like, <laughs> and you know, have you ever had those times where you know this is really inappropriate what I'm doing right now? But I can't stop. I just could not pull it together. And I'm like, <laughs> then my mum, who's a real character, she gets in on the act. She's like, that was my son. My son just got coat hanged, right? And so then all of a sudden they're laughing. Someone else is laughing. And then I can tell you, folks, and this was the real low moment of the day. The whole thing went belly up when Jesus lost it. <laughs> and so now it is just everyone's laughing. My poor Sabbath school leader who had put so much work and invested in this, she's just like, just done. And here's the thing. We drove home, we were laughing our heads off, it was so funny, and this is great. You know, it felt good to laugh, and, but here's the problem with pleasure. You see, it's never permanent. Because when I think about it today, yeah, I get a chuckle about the event. But if you try and build your life around the pursuit of pleasure, you're destined for discontent. It habituates. You need bigger and bigger hits. And this is why one of the Rockefellers once said, I can think of nothing less pleasurable than a life dedicated to the pursuit of pleasure. It's superficial. It's good. Enjoy it. Pleasure's awesome. Laugh. But recognise, and this is the Bible quote, you know, take the light in each light-filled hour, but remember, there will be many dark days. If you want to truly thrive, truly flourish, you need more than that. What do you need? We're going to get to E. I want you to call it out what you think it might be. One, two, three. That was quieter. But here it is, E, engagement. What the study suggests is that in order to flourish in life, what you need is stuff that you're into, you know, stuff that engages you, stuff that you do just for the fun of it. And ideally, hopefully, that's the work that you're going after. And you know what? You're here, you're being trained for a particular career path. Maybe that will be your career path. Fantastic. What I can say to you is that the extent to which you really engage in the things that you do will add value to your life. And if you ever find yourself in a, a, work, a job, let's say, that you actually doesn't engage you that much, is change it if you can. If you can't, if circumstances prevent you from doing that, hey, at least make sure you have a hobby. Now, this is what I tell my wife. I've got, I've got, in my garage, I've got hang gliders and I've got kite surfers and I've got mountain bikes because I have to do stuff that engages you. You have to do that. You know, it's not selfish. It actually so makes it sustainable. So what do you need to, to flourish, to thrive? Pleasure, engagement. A stands for... You're getting quieter. <laughs> what do you think A might stand for? Call it out. I think I heard it, it is achievement. Oh, so close. 
You know, what you actually need, the science indicates, you actually need a sense of accomplishment, a sense of doing things that actually give you that buzz, give you that sense of mastery, that sense of I've ticked it off. And what's fascinating about this, and notice the order I'm putting these in, there are actually things that you can do that don't give you much pleasure at the time of doing them, don't actually even engage you that much whilst you're doing them, but on, the, on their completion, give you that sense of, ah, you know what? And it adds to your life. I'll give you an example of this. When I was 20 years ago now, when I turned 30, I looked at my life, did a stock take and went, you know what? I feel very inadequate. Because, you know, my dad, he's a, he's a, he's a, a, a man's man, right? He can fix cars, build houses, um, you know, do all this sort of thing. He's a, he's a tradesman. And here I was, Right? All I'd done with all of my time up to the age of 30 is write dissertations that no one was ever going to read because they were so boring. Right? They're so boring. You know, I have a friend, true story, most dissertations are pit boring. Let me t t break the news to you. I have a friend who said that when he finished his thesis and you have to put a copy in the library, he went and put a $50 bill in the middle of it, put it in the shelf, every year goes back there, guess what? It's still there, it's still there. Just, you might, yeah, take that, t tuck that away. And so I just thought to myself, you know, this, this is no good. All I've done is write theses. I want to be more like my dad. So I need to do something to prove my manhood. I'm going to build a house. And so I said to my wife, let's build a house. And she's gone, I said, this will be my demonstration of manhood. She's gone, I don't like how this is going to end. Anyway, so we end up by, we bought a block of land, a plot, you know, an area. I drew these plans up. So we actually designed it ourselves. And then um, I somehow got it approved to be able to build this thing. I then bought a book on how to build houses. True story. And I was reading, okay, you do that. You dig a hole. All right, I'll dig a hole. And then I did this. And then you'd bang nail there and that. And then what I can tell you is that it took about a year. And was there a lot of pleasure involved? No, not really. Was I highly engaged in the process? No. There were many times I'm going, why did I do this? Um, however that sense of achievement. Today, when I stand back a long way and look at my house, I'll show you a photo, there's a sense of pride. <laughs> That's not actually my house. My house doesn't lean anywhere near as much as that. This is my house in the background there. Look at that. Oh, thank you. And then my three little kids, although they're all teenagers now. But, um, but what we know is that, you know, that, that, that sense of accomplishment is really valuable for a flourishing life. Okay, let's progress on. P-E-A-R-M. Now in R and M we come to the deep levels of flourishing. What do you think R might stand for? On the count of three. One, two, three. There you go, brothers and sisters, it is relationships. Let me introduce you to this guy here. This guy is uh, a gentleman by the name, a happiness researcher by the name of Dr. Robert Biswas Diner. He goes and lives with communities of people all around the world for an extended period of time to study what it is that makes them happy. And he said, I had this, this, this light bulb moment when I lived with the Kalahari Bushmen. He said, this particular day, we went out on a hunt. He said, it was a stinking hot day, so hot. He said, all day we came close to some prey, the Bushmen got close to some prey, and then the prey would run. And then after a whole day, I was completely exhausted, completely exacerbated, just... Um, just deflated, we had nothing to show for what we'd done. And he said, I t the, the bushman then ch spoke and said, it's now time to head back to the village, it's late in the day. And he said, my sh with my shoulders slumped, I turned around and as they started to go, the men started to sing a song. And it wasn't a, this sucks, life is terrible kind of song. He said it was an upbeat, happy song. Oh my God you know, upbeat and happy. And he thought, this is really puzzling. And he said, I turned to one of the bushmen and I said, you know what, I'm, I'm confused. He said, you seem happy even though we didn't catch anything. And he said, the bushman looks back at me and is a bit taken aback by this and says, hmm. He said, we didn't catch anything, but we didn't catch anything together. And see, what we know is that we're designed to live in community. Right? Relationships is what makes the world go around. And so value your relationships. It's deepest. It's getting now to the deepest levels of happiness. Let's flick that slide. I'm going to finish in just a minute. 
So, P, pleasure. E, engagement. A, achievement. R, relationships. But this is what the science says. To truly flourish in life, truly f thrive in life, you need this last thing, this deepest layer. And M stands for... What is it? One, two, three, call it out. Mm, some of you got it, I think. It is meaning. <laughs> meaning. You know, here is where it gets fascinating for me. This is what secular, secular psychology say about what it takes to truly flourish in life. And how, they, how do they define meaning? Well, they say that meaning is belonging to and serving something bigger than yourself. How Christian is that? And so this is my parting message for you guys. When my middle child, he's now 15, but when he was two, each night I'd go up and I'd say goodnight to him and I'd kiss him on the, the forehead and I'd say, hey, Lijie, his name's Elijah, we call him Lijie. I go, Lijie, Daddy loves you. And he'd go, Why? He'd ask this question, and so I'd make up an answer, and I'd go, well, because you're so good at climbing stuff. And then we'd do it. And then the next night, I'd go in, I'd kiss him on the forehead, and I'd say, good night, Lodgy, Daddy loves you. He'd go, why? And I'd say, oh, because you're so clever. And I'd make a, something up every night, and then it was only after a month I realised how stupid I was, and I knew what I had to say. And so that evening when I went in, and I gave him a kiss on the forehead, and I said, Good night, Lygie. Daddy loves you. And he goes, why? I said, because Lygie, you belong to me. You are mine. And there is nothing you can do, good or bad, that will ever change that. You see, as Christians, we have the ultimate power source in the universe who doesn't just accept but loves you unconditionally. Nothing good or bad that you can do to change that. You belong to something bigger than yourself. And what's remarkable is that when you embrace that, he then goes, hey, and I've got a part for you to play. Here's how I want you to serve. I hope you discover that. It's the path to truly thriving.